Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here bringing you this video today from Jerusalem on a uh, sunny Friday here as we get into the summer. And I wanted to record a video today about five things that I dislike slash hate about living in Israel. A few days ago, I uploaded a video to this YouTube channel entitled 10 Things I Love about living in Israel because I was recording it on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, which was just a couple of days ago. That's Israel's Independence Day, National Day, and Israel just turned 75, which as I remarked in the video, is really just, it's very hard to wrap your head around. There's lots of people who are older than the state of Israel. But of course, while I attempted to be positive, it wouldn't really be me if I just gave the upside of the story. So today I'm gonna to talk about five things that I think suck about living in Israel. Okay, so my number one grievance about living in Israel has to be the cost of living. And you're gonna hear so many people talk, moan and complain about that. So I'm really just adding myself to the, to the, to the pile of moaners, uh, disaffected people who were unhappy with the cost of living in Israel. I've done an article before with various statistics about, I think it came out two years ago, that Tel Aviv was officially the most expensive city in the world and Israel's cost of living was the fifth highest in the world. And relative to OECD countries, in real income, in other words, what people actually, the purchasing power of their income, that Israel was actually the most expensive country in the OECD. The thing about these statistics is they change from year to year and they change according to the methodologies used to uh, compile them. So without really quoting any specific numbers to make my case, just trust me that Israel is extremely expensive and by all accounts, one of the most expensive countries to live in the world. Now, how did Israel get to this point? This is a whole separate issue and if you're interested in the socioeconomic picture about Israel I recommend checking out an interview I did with uh, Dan Ben David um, who is president at the Shorish Institution I uploaded that about last week and he's got some interesting ideas a lot of it comes down to very protectionist policies in Israel Israel being incredibly difficult about standard setting and then Israel being kind of a geopolitical island because while Israel isn't technically an island. There are land masses to the, you know, three sides of it, but Israel doesn't really have relations with Syria, um, tenuous relations with Egypt and Jordan. So any kind of country like that tends to be expensive where stuff, you know, has to come into the airport and through more expensive forms of freight. It's been a very long standing issue in Israel. And there are attempts going on to introduce more foreign competition and break the monopolies and oligopolies that are basically the bane of many people's existence in Israel, the root cause of the cost of living. Recently, we saw Carrefour opening in Israel, the French supermarket store, and having normal prices for basics like olive oil. It does not make any sense to me why olive oil in an Israeli supermarket is more expensive than olive oil in Ireland where there are precisely zero olive trees in the country. There's probably someone who's growing an olive tree in a greenhouse, but let's just say there's zero olive trees in Ireland. It doesn't make any sense. It's very irritating. And unless you're in sort of the small part of the economy that is high earning, and I've met, I'll do a video about high tech, what exactly that means. It's one of these words Israelis throw around all the time. It means roughly, uh, what I would call software companies, IT companies, uh, the Central Bureau of Statistics, the CBS has a slightly more technical definition of what high tech is. But what people forget about high tech is that it only actually constitutes about 10% of the workforce, which means that 90% of Israelis are not employed in high tech. Now that figure was from about a year ago, it might have updated, but the cost of living and the salaries do not meet essentially. And that is, I think, the enormous problem about living in Israel. And just the day-to-day -day financial stress that that creates is very negative. So that is definitely something I dislike about living here. Okay, reason number two is the security situation. And if you're not living in Israel, this might be the number one thing thing you think when you know someone tells you they live in Israel you're like are you living in a war zone are you living in a bomb shelter and the truth is that Israel's security situation has always been problematic I think it always will be problematic sadly because there are countries that just are not wavering uh, in their desire to obliterate Israel including most famously 
Iran at the morning, but uh, at the moment. But there's also a lot of domestic problems here, of course, with the Palestinian issue. Now, I'm not trying to trying not to go too far into the Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Arab conflict and get mired mired down in this argument. I would say two things about the security situation in Israel. The first is that it's not a war zone. It's definitely a safe country. Uh, to visit and that doesn't mean that Israel isn't under attack it just means that you know the statistical probability of a rocket falling on you is still relatively modest something else that's really interesting about Israel is the rate of crime in Israeli cities is actually very very low uh, a lot lower than you'll see in American cities so in an odd sense it's safer um, than a lot of cities in Europe and in another sense there is unlike many many countries in the world probably most countries it's fair to say that looming threat of uh, attacks and terrorism now something that's been happening recently uh, you know going on for not really that recently actually a few years now is these lone wolf attacks by palestinian militants i live in jerusalem which is kind of like the ground zero for you know the israeli-palestinian conflict the al-aqsa mosque the temple mount is like the most sensitive part of the most sensitive city in the whole country so it's really where stuff tends to happen a few days ago there was a very disturbing heinous attack in jerusalem in which a driver uh, just outside the shuk mahane huda the uh commonly called just the shuk in jerusalem a guy uh, a car ramming attack rammed into uh, pedestrians last time i checked there was seven people um affected one person seriously wounded one person moderately wounded and five people with light wounds but there are fatal attacks pretty much on a regular basis here it mightn't be one a day or might be two a day um but these kind of stabbing attacks car ramming attacks really whatever shooting attacks whatever people can pull off um do happen pretty regularly and it, it's ne it's a negative it's definitely a stress about living here um in jerusalem specifically and in israel generally that we unfortunately uh, have to deal with and just try to make the best of Okay, getting into more practical uh, matters, uh, let's, let's talk about working in Israel. Now, I already talked about the cost of living being super high and salaries not necessarily stacking up. Another petty grievance I have, or this might seem like a petty grievance, is the amount of time off. The mandatory vacation in Israel is really small. It's only 12 days per year. Um, there's also no no such thing. I, I mean, I grew up in, in Ireland, so we had this wonderful thing called bank holidays, which is like... The weekend in most countries, of course, is not the same as in Israel. It's uh, Saturday and Sunday. And then like six times a year, however many times, there is Monday off and that's called a bank holiday. In Israel, there's only actually really one day per year. That is a day in which not everything is closed because on the days that are religious holidays like uh, the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, etc., everything shuts down. The bus network shuts down. The country shuts down, uh, which is good if you're Jewish and religiously observant, but you can't really do a whole lot on those days, um, if, especially if you don't have a car besides like hang out at home. So uh, the one exception really to that rule is Yom, Atzma, Yom Ha Atzma'ut and uh, Purim, I guess, as well, uh, the national day that I just mentioned at the start of this video. So the mandatory amount of time off. Now, there are companies in Israel in the high-tech scene, it's getting more competitive as people offering better benefits uh, to their employees. So 12 is just the minimum, you know, bare minimum that you'll start out with. But coupled with the fact that the standard workday is often nine to six, which is a long work week, 12 days off, no bank holidays, and you work on Sunday. The work week in Israel is Sunday through Thursday. So those are the working days are Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday is a weekend day. Thursday night is a weekend night. And then on Saturday, you always kind of feel cheated out of a weekend because it's the Jewish Shabbat, which happens every single week. And again, the country kind of shuts down, the transport shuts down. You can't really, uh, the shops are, most shops are closed. So I think there needs to be bank holidays in Israel. They talked about doing it a while back um, and unfortunately the main trade union, Hahis Tadrut, opposed it. Very negative. I think Israelis are overworked. One thing I did see recently is companies in Tel Aviv exploring the four-day work week and I think that's amazing. Uh, can the Israel's national broadcaster just did a piece about it 
are profiling a few companies in Tel Aviv, trying it and reporting their employees were less stressed, just as productive or even more productive. And I think that we all need, we all could use here a better work-life balance and uh, that is a negative too. Grievance four about living in Israel. The noise in this place, the constant yelling, it's chaos. Whenever I go back to, uh, to Ireland, which admittedly I haven't gone very much in the last few years, but the way I described it, I mean, it sounds like an insult, but it, like, it's actually a compliment as it feels like someone turned down the volume on life. It's just quieter and more peaceful. Israel's a Mediterranean country, so people drive here like crazy. If you haven't driven in Israel, prepare for the experience by going to your nearest amusement park and uh, you know taking one of those dodgem things because that's uh, generally uh, what it what it feels like here frequently driving standards are a little bit crap but it's just a noisy live country there is a lot of shouting Israelis are very passionate hot-blooded people um, people certainly like to they love a good argument they love a heated argument so sometimes you'll see people screaming at one another and then hugging a few minutes later. So it's a very, te very temperamental country sometimes. And this isn't really something I have to say that I hate. I'm just offering a five part listicle because, you know, I thought I had to come up with five negatives. If I did 10 positives, I want, I want there to be more positives. So if, if you're sick of my complaining already, go watch the 10 things I love about living in Israel to get cleansed of my toxicity and my negativity. Uh, but the intensity of Israel, I don't, I think that's something most people, most Israelis would actually say, like that is genuinely a thing here. The solution, low cost airfares to Europe, I mentioned in my previous video that it's become a lot easier to uh, get out of Israel and travel. And it's actually a good base for traveling into Europe. Uh, so you have now Ryanair, Wizz, EasyJet. There's even cheap flights to Dubai because of the Abraham Accords. So the solution to this small, intense, politically charged country, in my opinion, is uh, getting out of it periodically. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, today, thankfully, is becoming more and more affordable to do. All right, the last negative in my list of complaints, five things I hate about living in Israel. Number five is the cost of property. Now you might say, Daniel, you're cheating me out of one grumpy negative reason that you don't like living in Israel because wasn't, wasn't number one, the cost of living. And I think that the cost of property is such a monumental issue here that it merits its own thing on my list of complaints. So therefore it is number five. It's gonna be the, the concluding entry on the list. How expensive is property in Israel? I've done videos about it before, uh, but here's one statistic that I think is more interesting than any other one or really sort of illustrates the problem. And that was um, an article by Ricky Ben David in the Times of Israel about a year ago. They talked about the relentless rise of property in Israel, which to state the obvious may make Israeli property a great investment option if you're already wealthy enough to buy multiple properties. If you're a young person trying to get on the property ladder, trying to save money from your average, relatively skimpy Israeli salary and high cost of living, it feels like trying to piss against a stream. I was I was trying to think of some less vulgar alternative. Sorry, that's my vulgarity uh, for for the for the day. So it's really super super problematic here. And in that article, the statistic mentioned was that on average. A couple needs to put up 250,000 US dollars in equity, a little bit more actually, but let's just call it 250, a quarter of a million US dollars in equity. That's for the down payment. I'm not talking about the cost of the property. That's to just get the, the, get the mortgage. So Israel has, again, the statistics vary year to year. One statistic I read said Israeli property per square meter is the most expensive in the uh, in the world. Last year, 2022, despite the sort of impending global recession, we saw the property market rise quite significantly year on year. So it seems to be the bubble that just keeps inflating. Uh, as we would say in Hebrew, bayati, which means problematic for folks in my situation. Um, a lot of people got on, the pro got on the property ladder 20, 30 years ago when stuff was a lot cheaper. And uh, friarim, suckers like me, who only made it to this place, in 2015 now feel like we're trying to climb 
Mount Everest without an oxygen tank. That's how it feels. It just does not feel possible. And that's a bit depressing. Um, now, I know this is a global trend. I know people in other countries are experiencing the same thing about young people being locked out of the property market. But I would say the dynamic here, it feels like kind of the leading edge of the dynamic for the cost of property in Israel. And because the smallest mortgages are mandated by law at a relatively high rate, for the down payment, I could like literally buy a property on cash in cities in Ireland. So it's a huge problem and it's something that uh, Israel definitely needs to uh, tackle. And the final sort of angle to this problem, I would say, is that the rental market here is also kind of sucky. I did a video recently, I, I'm not intending to just plug all my videos back to back here, but if you're interested in Israel, one called uh, The Depressing Nature of Renting in Israel or something like that. And I showed some photos from a very funny Facebook page called Dirot Shea Midakototi by Israel, which means apartments that depress me in Israel. Now I say it's funny because the photos are just so bad. There's like a sink next to a bed, there's, uh, there was one of a bed above a toilet. Just the depressing places that landlords are renting for high rent in uh, Israel. And the rental market's pretty badly regulated here. There are really not much tenant protection laws. The few they tried to bring in, there was one um, attempting to make it illegal to charge a view, uh, sorry, not a viewing fee, a finding fee to, re to, to realtors. Uh, and that was basically, they got around that because the realtors would say, you need to sign a piece of paper waiving your right to not have this charge or you won't see the property. So unfortunately, it's a bit of a balagan. It's a bit of a shanda. It's a bit of a mess. And uh, it just makes it uh, more and more uh, a frustrating dynamic. And I think something that needs to be top of Israel's socioeconomic agenda, if they're going to attract people, Jewish people, other people from around the world to come live here. It can't be a country for rich Jews only that it's impossible for your average couple to buy a house, which is sadly the reality we've arrived at in 2023. That was my list of grievances, uh, five things I hate about living in Israel, dislike about living in Israel. Now go watch my uh, 10 things I love about living in Israel, as I said, to cleanse yourself from my uh, negative energy today. Uh, but I hope that's been a sort of at least uh, maybe eye-opening for people who are want to come here with their eyes wide open and understand what are, the, what, are the, what are the good things about living here, what are some of the challenges. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list. If you want to do some of your own complaining about living in Israel, the comment section is free to you. For you to use, uh, mention things I didn't list, etc. Uh, this channel is about Jerusalem and Israel. And if you do want to get more videos from me on those aforementioned subjects, to uh, hit the subscribe button, like it, and uh, tell your friends about this channel. It all helps to, 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 to make me sufficiently motivated to continue speaking into a camera on a Friday morning in Jerusalem on a very, very hot day where apparently my air conditioner is not working or something because it's boiling in here. Anyway, thanks for watching. Until next time.